Okay, I think we finally figured this out. Um, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Dr. Ben Chapman. I'm a food safety specialist at NC State University. Uh, I'm here to answer your questions on COVID-19 and food safety. Um, I'm gonna wait uh, just a couple of minutes uh, here, even though we're a little bit late, uh, wait a couple minutes while people join. Uh, and uh, if you have questions, please feel free to write them in the comments and I will absolutely answer them to the best of my ability. Um, and I think we're, uh, we're about ready to go. So I see a few of you have joined. Um, first, uh, first thing I want to um, highlight and, uh, and uh, share with you is a, um, a page that we've put together at NC State um, that is um, really focused on uh, food safety and uh, COVID-19. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, and share with you is available at this link uh, that I just posted in the um, in the chat box. Um, we'll, we're really going to try and do a bunch of these over the um, the next uh, few weeks uh, as more information evolves around food safety and COVID-19. I'm going to do uh, as much uh, uh, of this uh, as possible, really, to, to answer all the questions that, that you might have and share anything that, uh, that we have that's evolving and talk a little bit through some of the science um, around what's happening uh, in the world of COVID-19. Uh, so um, first, I'll, I'll apologize. This is my uh, first Facebook Live experience. So uh, sometimes we don't uh, uh, figure out all the technology um, up front and the things that uh, you think are going to look the way they are supposed to look don't. Um, so anyway, we got it all figured out. Um, and for those of you who are viewing and seeing this for the first time and are thinking about doing their own Facebook Live, tips that I just learned about, use Chrome. Uh, and uh, that's the and, and then then uh, use an uh, the older version of Facebook Live because the new one didn't quite work. Um, so let me let me walk through a few questions that we've received th in the Safe Plates Information Center, Food Safety Information Center, over the weekend, and really talk about some of the things that that we're hearing all throughout. Um, uh, any of the media work or any questions that I'm uh, getting from consumers uh, around uh, COVID-19 and, and food safety. So the, the biggest thing that I want to highlight is uh, right, right off the top that there are no indication right now, we don't have any data or any information that illnesses um, of, of COVID-19 are happening through the consumption of food. Um, and, and the absence of, of data doesn't, doesn't prove that food isn't uh, something for us to take focus on, but um, I'll, I'll share a little bit of information um, about why we believe that, that food really isn't a source of, of illness. One of the biggest uh, data sets that we have right now is really the epidemiology of all the people um, across the world who are getting sick from, uh, from COVID-19. And many of the clusters of illnesses that are being investigated by local health departments um, and health uh, professionals throughout the world, in these clusters, what we're really seeing is person to person transfer. And so what, is, what does that really mean? Well, here in the US, um, if you saw uh, on Friday and over the, over the weekend, um, there was a lot of uh, um, information and recommendations from the Center for Disease Control around using cloth face masks for anybody who's in, in public. That's really to control any person to person transmission of the virus. What we do believe in a respiratory virus such as um, SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that, that leads to COVID-19, is that the virus will replicate in our respiratory system. And then as people interact with each other, whether that means, whether that means that they are, you know, maybe displaying symptoms and coughing or sneezing, or even just like laughing or talking loud, there are a ch there's a chance that 
uh, moisture droplets out of our mouth that could be infected with, uh, could contain the virus, not, not infected with the virus, but contain the virus, contaminated with the virus from our respiratory system, could then sort of disperse and get into uh, another person's respiratory system. So a mask can protect that. Uh, process for someone who is uh, carrying the, the virus from transmitting to, to other people. That's really the number one um, uh, reason for, for a mask. All of the epidemiology, all of the study of disease that we're, we're seeing as it relates to um, specifically these clusters of illness really show per people being around other people who are sick or who are asymptomatic, meaning they're infected, but they're not displaying any of the symptoms, or maybe pre-symptomatic, they may display symptoms um, uh, eventually, but aren't at that time. Those are really the, the biggest risk factors. So um, what we would expect to see in a situation um, around um, uh, a foodborne illness outbreak would be that individuals who all went to the same restaurant or ate uh, food from the same grocery store over a period of time could be uh, linked together with illnesses. And that's not something that we're seeing at all. In fact, all of the clusters that we are seeing, all the information that's coming out, and this is good, good emerging data, um, uh, we, we had uh, some publications over the last couple of weeks looking at clusters of illness um, in China, looking at clusters of illnesses in Italy, and looking at clusters of illnesses here in the U.S., specifically in Washington State and also around some of the uh, cruise ships that um, were apparent right at the start of this, this outbreak. What we're seeing in those outbreaks is, is or those clusters is um, food has not popped up as a risk factor for transmission um, whatsoever. If we look at all the common things that these individuals have, eating the same things is not one of them. Now, gathering in a dining room, um, eating at a, uh, at a facility in a, in a, um, in a uh, nursing home or gathering in the same dining room in a cruise ship actually were considered to be risk factors. Uh, what we believe though is that it's being around people, being very close to, to individuals is, is sort of the reason why we, why we see this and not spread through food um, over time. The other sort of factor that, that goes into this, we don't have any evidence of transmission of, of disease through food, is really comes down to what we're learning and what we already know about the biology of coronaviruses. Coronaviruses um, are largely respiratory viruses, um, and meaning they, they uh, lead to symptoms in the respiratory tract um, that you have seen uh, if you're if you're following the the news I'm, I'm sure you've seen information about persistence of the virus on different surfaces which we're really learning about um, and dispersal of the virus um, and how you know, whether it can be aerosolized or whether it's just moisture droplets um, and uh, and, and then what, what, what also goes into this um, sort of decision making on, on data is what we know about SARS-CoV-1 or another coronavirus that led to uh, an outbreak in 2003 and 2004 um, of uh, a, a, something called severe acute respiratory syndrome. And in, in the investigation of that virus and, and what we believe looks very similar to SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, in uh, certain instances over the last 15 years, we've looked at depositing virus particles in a laboratory on food and trying to recover those virus particles from that food to see whether how long it survives. And this is an area that we, we don't have a whole lot of data on, but the data that we do have looks really promising that shows if we deposit the virus um, this, this previous virus on berries, we, we actually have trouble recovering it at all from the berries. So I put a known amount on a berry. Can I go find that known amount? It's really difficult to, to actually go and, and find it and get it. The, the second thing um, with it uh, in previous research is we've, uh, researchers have looked at putting that virus on um, lettuce in the laboratory to find out how well it could be recovered. In that case, the virus could be recovered at a much lower level over time. So we do believe that 
Um, the virus loses its ability to persist in the environment over time. We've seen that on other um, on other surfaces, but um, we we don't have the same kind of data on food. And food surfaces are actually fairly different from uh, what you've seen in in the news on packaging, cardboard, plastic, hard surfaces, metal. Where food, um, because it's a biological. Um, item, there might be oils, there might be other phytochemicals, other compounds that are intrinsic as part of that food that can really be impacting the virus and reducing its, its persistence. The other big factor when it comes to food is that we eat food and not breathe it. And, and I know that might sound really obvious and, and, um, and kind of silly, but the fact that, that, that if there is a virus that is on that food, that it goes into through our esophagus into our stomach where our stomach has a very low pH or high acidity, that really impacts the biology of the virus as well. And so all of those things, the fact that we haven't seen um, any indication in any of our clusters of illness that food was a factor, uh, combined with all the biology and what we do know, um, you know, investigating food, it really is, is putting um, uh, food safety professionals, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, FDA, USDA, all sort of aligned with, with the message of we don't have any evidence, we don't have any information right now that food is a, um, a risk factor, consuming food is, is, a, is a risk factor. So what, what things can we do? And so one of the questions that, that we received, uh, that we're receiving quite a bit and, and came in over the, this weekend specifically to, to talk about in Facebook Live today, is this idea of could eating fresh produce cause COVID-19? And so I'm gonna answer this in, in a way that, that hopefully doesn't sound like I'm uh, avoiding the question, but as someone who works really a lot in food safety, we're often faced with this idea of risk. And so a question of could it cause COVID-19, as a scientist, I find it really hard to, to answer in absolutes. I think that there's, there's a possibility, absolutely, that this could be it. Now, what we're really talking about is what is the likelihood? What is the chance? And I don't think we have any really hard numbers on this, but I would say that we're starting, if we're trying to put magnitudes on it, it might be like a one in a billion chance, a one in 10 billion chance, a one in a trillion chance, and less likely in the one in 10 or one in 100 um, aspect for all the reasons that I, that I just talked about on why we're not seeing food as, as a source. So um, I, I just wanna be really careful in, in answering, and really as a scientist, Almost anything is possible, and and as this is why we're looking every day for more information. I don't, I don't feel like we have sealed off our expectations as food safety specialists in the food safety world of saying, oh, we've solved it. It's definitely never going to be a food issue. Let's not worry about it. In fact, every day we're looking to make sure that we have all the information that's available and we're really trying to find out. But all the ind indication really, really is pointing towards this this aspect of uh, of of no, um, we don't believe that there is a very very a very high chance. It's it's very 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 low risk. In fact, the higher risk um, is is actually going to shop for produce as opposed to eating it uh, when it comes to to food safety. I'm more likely to get sick, um, you know, just picking out my apples than I am from the apples themselves or whatever produce that that you're um, that, that you're interested in. One thing that I that I will highlight, though, and this is a, again something that I'm really trying to answer um, the same way as we've been going along on this on this entire issue, is that um, food safety messages, uh, things around rinsing produce, hand washing, um, not cross contaminating, cleaning and sanitizing our kitchens, cleaning and sanitizing um, any surfaces that we are preparing food or handling food. Um, around these things really are not any different um, right now. Uh, we're not uh, suggesting anything anything new. And in fact, all the things that we would suggest in normal food safety time are extremely protective uh, as we go through this process uh, as well. So specifically to produce, what does that mean? Well, it means that if I rinse my produce, I could take that very, 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 very low risk, unlikely chance that the virus is there down even further. 
And when one of the things that I do want to want to highlight that I think is important anytime we're talking about fresh produce is that, excuse me, as we look at at fresh produce, um, we're only ever uh, removing at the most 90 to 99 percent of what might be there by rinsing it off. Um, I can't make that any better if I do some of the things, some of the silly things that people have been suggesting out there. Um, whether that be like using soap uh, to wash my produce, washing my produce in vinegar, washing my produce in dilute um, chlorine uh, solution, I would I would suggest against all of those things. Um, and and I'll let me let me walk you down why. I don't we don't really have data that would show that it's any better than what I can do with with just rinsing under cold water. When it comes to soap, we do have a lot of information to. Uh, to demonstrate that soap itself can be uh, can cause nausea, so there's a, a risk. It's not soap is for hands, soap is for um, surfaces. It's not for food. And when we do have soap residues that exist that we consume, uh, there is a chance that, that that could make you sick, not foodborne illness sick, but lead to an upset stomach or, or nausea. Um, in fact, if you look at M any MDS sheet, so the material data safety sheets for things like so it does talk about like these soaps not for ingestion um it's not built built that way and that's information that we've known about for decades and, and decades when it comes to dilute chlorine this is another one that really concerns me um message wise because we have a situation where uh that dilute chlorine if if not rinsed off um you could burn your mouth uh, and lead to other risk issues when it comes to vinegar, vinegar to me is, is also not going to do anything, but I don't see an additional risk. If someone wants to rinse their stuff in vinegar, I'm not gonna um, suggest to them that that's gonna make anything riskier. I just would wanna say that it's not doing anything from a safety standpoint. Um, so rinsing with water is really where, this, where the science um, is really, um, uh, it really points us to. So any precautions while eating fresh produce, um, you know, could it cause this? You know, we, we don't we don't have any evidence about it. Things that I want to do for precautions are just rinse with cold water um, and not using any additional cleaning agents because, um, you know, number one, it's not any better. We don't have any data to show that um, that it would be better. And, and two, it could lead to, to additional risks. Um, I'll, I'll take a question um, here from from Peggy uh, in the um, in the chat box. So Peggy writes, the national news is still saying last night to leave non-perishable food outside for 72 hours and wipe down plastic uh, milk cartons and other containers with sterilizing wipes. I, I don't like that information um, uh, from a science-based standpoint. There's a few um, limitations. So as we step out of what normally happens in the world of, uh, of science and food safety, we've got a um, situation here where I think it's important to think about how things are evolving. And so there was a, um, a, a paper that was published last week or two weeks ago, maybe in the New, G New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious journals out there that talked about virus, this virus specifically and its persistence in the environment for a long time. Um, and uh, being for a long time, more than hours up to days. And one of the, the limitations that I think we have right now is trying to figure out what a magical time frame would be. And so Peggy, 72 hours seems reasonable based on that paper. We may find over the next five or six months or five or six years that there's more information that to go on to say 72 hours is too long, 72 hours is too short, um, relative humidity matters, what the temperature matters. And I think that, that here in North Carolina, we've had just you know wonderful weather over the last couple of days. I have, I have a colleague in, um, in New Jersey where in his garage, um, the temperature of his garage is like 43 degrees. And so it's different for different temperatures. And we don't really have enough information right now to say this is the magic number because of all these other factors. The other big thing, though, is that um, I can control the movement of the virus from packaging, even though we believe it's really, really, really low risk. I can control that movement through hand washing. The virus itself is not going to move from my pack, my food package, from any of my packaging um, to to my inside my mouth. Like it's not going to go um, anywhere. Uh, it's not going to um, uh, move on its own. It's going to 
uh, move through hands. So my suggestion really is to say, all that we would suggest in normal food safety time is as I come home, I'm putting my groceries away. When I re-enter my home after being outside, anywhere, I'm washing my hands. That's a best practice. Before I'm making food, as I'm putting food away, any food handling, I'm washing my hands. I'm breaking that, that pathway of transmission um, through the things that I do have available. I would not suggest wiping down containers with sterilizing wipes. Um, it, it, as well, and this is just how I'm handling it, mainly because sterilizing wipes, uh, uh, disinfectant wipes, uh, sanitizer, whatever it is that you have, is really in short supply. Um, as we, as I would expect that we'll be, I'll be staying at home. Um, we'll all be staying at home for the next couple of months. Um, I want to, I want to keep those sanitizing wipes for when I need them, when I have to go to the doctor, if I'm going to a grocery store and I absolutely uh, know that there's not cart wipes there, um, I want to take those those wipes and the sanitizer I do have for that. I want and and really the biggest risk for me is if an individual has um, uh, um, it, you know someone in my house gets sick uh, from COVID nineteen, I need to have those sanitizing wipes for that because I don't want to go through it just in this normal everyday food packaging thing and then all of a sudden one of my kids gets sick or I get sick and one of us needs to go into isolation in the house and we're using disinfectants all the time to make sure not everybody else gets sick. I, I don't want to use that supply because I know every time I try to order it, I can't get what I need. So anything that I do have, I want to I want to keep on hand. It's a, it's a great question, Peggy. I disagree with with the national news on that, um, and I think that it's it, it is a uh, um, in, in certain cases. In fact, I, I saw um, uh, a couple other um, individuals, uh, the Surgeon General, saying that this is something that he was doing. I also think that it's it's for that's a decision for people that have the resources and have some sort of access to it. But hand washing around packaging is really uh, a way to, to stop the, the mode of transmission. So again, that just that increased hand washing. I'll, I'll, I'll talk through um, the um, sort of, I guess, a, maybe a confusing question about why would we suggest that, we, that I should um, sanitize my cart handle versus my packaging? when I'm at, at the grocery store. To me, the cart handle, this is all a numbers game. This is all about statistics and mathematics. And the number of people who may have touched the cart handle in my grocery store is way higher, just based on how many people are at a grocery store, the persistence, like I, I, I would guess we're in the dozens of people that will touch that, that cart handle um, in the three or four days or six days of, of virus persistence, depending on what data you're, you're, you're looking at. Um, and so if, if it's not being uh, sanitized or disinfected in between use, then that high touch surface, all the virus that might be on someone's hands as they cough um, or as they're talking to someone could end up on that, on that card. It's just more chances for transmission. Packaging, it is true that people will grab things off of uh, off of a shelf, but I, I would not expect that dozens and dozens of hands have touched my box of cereal or my my bag of of beans or um, even my produce in the produce section multiple times. It's really just about one or two or you know maybe a few people, but. I can break the transmission in my hands when it's the cart. I'm, I'm my hands are off the cart. I'm picking things up um, over and over again, and I just want to make sure that I start as clean and sanitized and disinfected as possible with my cart um, right at right at the start. It's a great you know it's a great question. Um, another question just about um uh how should produce be handled when food shopping so I, I would suggest in in this case and this is really what I do and this is no different than normal food safety time I'm very um, uh, aware that anything that my produce touches whether that's my cart whether that's my hands um, whether that's uh, you know the basket um, whether that what you know whatever it is anything that that produce touches could pick up any sort of contaminant right now obviously we're talking about SARS-CoV-2 but I would look the exact same way at, at it as norovirus and so I'm not a person who as I do my shopping looking at any of the produce that's unprotected whether that's tomatoes or avocados even though it's something that I'm not um, eating the outside I, I'm very much taking 
all of my produce and I'm putting it into bags that that I know are not um, uh, you know contaminated with something because I don't have control over. It. So how do I do that in normal times? I'm using produce plastic bags. I'll use my reusable shopping bags, and I'm still using reusable shopping bags right now um, uh, through this in the you know few times that I have been to the uh, to the grocery store. But I know. Uh, because my reusable shopping bags are something that I control. I can launder those. I can keep any contaminants out of it. I know that this is uh, something that that I can um, I, I can manage. So so really, I, how I approach and and how I approach every shopping trip is I think about how would a microbe get onto my food and how am I increasing risk or re reducing risk through all of the things that I'm trying to do and. In just in normal times, as well as in COVID nineteen times, I'm thinking very specifically about um, what what surfaces uh, that my produce is is touching. Um, uh, so next, you know, I, I alluded to uh, plastic bags or reusable bags when buying produce. I, I don't think one is better than the other. This is another question that that I received um, over the weekend. Are are plastic bags or reusable bags better when you're buying produce? Um, I, I think they both carry the same minimal risk. Again, it's person to person. I want to really highlight highlight that. Um, the plastic bags that come off a roll, they're not sterile, but I don't have any indication that someone has been breathing in them based on I'm pulling it off, off of a roll. So I would expect them to be very, very, very low risk um, you know, on the inside. My reusable bags, I can control that. Um, and, and what I'm doing with my reusable bags, I'm coming home, um, I'm, as soon as I enter my house, actually, let me, let me go back to what I'm doing. I'm leaving the grocery store. I'm going to my, going to my car. I have hand sanitizer in my car. I'm squirting that sanitizer on. I'm making sure that I'm not taking anything from my, um, uh, I'm not taking anything from from my hands and putting it in my car. I want to break anything that I brought from the outside using that that sanitizer. Um, I'm then like rubbing that sanitizer on my steering wheel. Then I'm going back to my cart. I'm unloading um, stuff into my um, uh, uh, unloading things back you know, into the back of my car. Coming back in, doing a second sanitizer um, squirt just to make sure that anything I've, I've broken that transmission. And then. I'm being very mindful before I get home of touching my face, um, where my hands are going. When I get home, I leave my food in the car for a minute. I go wash my hands. I come back out. I transfer everything into my countertop. Um, I'm unloading my grocery stores onto my counters. I take my reusable bags and I put them directly into the laundry. Um, I, I put my uh, groceries away and then I wash my hands again. And then as I'm taking my groceries, and again, this is not a... a I want to really reiterate, this is not something that we should, uh, that this is just a COVID-19 time. When I'm handling packaging and I'm doing food preparation, I'm washing my hands because of norovirus, because of salmonella, because of pathogenic E. coli all the time, not just because of COVID-19. So I'm continuing up that that habit. Someone asked me in a in an interview this last week, you know, as we went as I went through this about how many times would I expect I'm washing my hands in a day? I would say that in a normal time, I'm probably washing my hands 15 times, 18 times. I may be washing my hands three or four more times a day now, um, uh, in, in general, um, because I'm, I'm like more mindful. But I don't feel like I and 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 this is you know because I'm often and I just got a text from uh, from Dr. Kirby who said I've never thought about how a microbe would get on my food, but now I will ponder that. I'm always worried about how microbes would get on my food and in my hands, and I think this is just being part of being a microbiologist that I'm focused on that. So I'm constantly trying to break that that mode of transmission, and, and hopefully this will make us more mindful um, all around for for things going going forward. Um, the last question that I have, um, and please, if you have questions, um, uh, please go ahead and, and write them in the in the comment box. Um, right now, I'm happy to, to answer anything, but the last one that I have on my list is really about hand sanitizer. And the question being, does hand sanitizer, quote, kill the virus? Um, well, and I'll give you the, the sort of nuanced food safety microbiology answer, viruses in my, and, and there's a little bit of debate on this, viruses really aren't alive. Viruses, for me, um, something, for if something's alive, 
it has the ability to replicate on its own. It's, it's got a, a way to grow. And viruses can't do that. They just persist in the environment. Um, and they are largely made up of two things. One, some sort of genetic material. So DNA in some viruses. Uh, COVID, SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19 is, is not a DNA virus. It's actually RNA, which is a little bit different. We, in our cells, we have DNA that, that gets made into RNA that then gets made by our cell, that is taken by our cells, and it leads into a bunch of um, protein um, uh, synthesis that allows us to grow. Viruses can't do that. They, what they do is they need a host to actually go in to replicate. And so viruses to me are, are one of the most amazing, excuse me, <clears throat> one of the most amazing things because at, through evolution, this little bit of, of genetic materials figured out a way to take over a host cells to make more of it. it it'll enter in, into a cell, um, uh, cut and, 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 and uh, uh, paste really, uh, its own uh, genetic material into my genetic material. It'll take over my cell to make more virus particles. Um, and then in certain cases, it'll just break apart that cell and leave this like genetic material to, um, uh, to move. In other cases, it needs a protein coat. And in this case with coronaviruses, um, it needs this protein coat. So it actually takes my cell and makes its own protein code and then blows up the cell and then moves from cell to cell to cell. So that little biology um, uh, history was really to, to help um, answer um, the question of whether, wh whether hand sanitizer kills it. Well, like I said, I don't think they're really alive. What we're really talking about is can it stop it from um, uh, infecting and can it uh, really do something to either alter the genetic ma material or uh, in this case when it comes to coronavirus the protein coat and the good news is that alcohol-based hand sanitizer um, really and this this is where percentages matter so alcohol-based san hand sanitizer over 70 percent we know for sure will inactivate uh, blow apart that protein coat and make it so the virus in in the environment can't then use that protein coat to add, gain entry into our cells and 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 take over um, our cells. So in, with this virus, we actually have a really good tool in hand sanitizer. Now the 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 biggest problem here is it does all hand sanitizer do this? And and I would say gen generically no. Much of the hand sanitizer that's available on the market is in this 70% um, uh, uh, range. So that's really, really good. But there are other sanitizers, people that will market as sanitizers. I've seen it, it because we can't get um, alcohol-based sanitizer everywhere right now where it's coming in in, in shipments, but, but it's off the shelves re relatively quickly. Um, where people are using like natural products for sanitizer, like I've seen witch hazel, does not, doesn't work the same way as alcohol against this protein coat. Um, and, and so other things like um, even lower, if we've seen like any, anytime you see a, a, a hand sanitizer that is alcohol free, I would be really skeptical again about its efficacy, specifically against coronavirus. Um, and, uh, and, and that's one of the things that we really have to sort of keep in, keep in mind um, through this, through this whole thing. So, so yes, hand sanitizer of specific parameters has the ability to stop the virus from being able to uh, infect uh, and really blow apart that, that protein coat, um, which, is, which is a really, really great, great tool. But the, but the other good news is washing my hands with soap does the exact same thing uh, or a very similar thing. So this is one of the situations where just having soap and water available um, really, really, really matters uh, in, in risk reduction. Dr. Kirby, Sarah, thanks for uh, um, sharing that I called you out. Uh, That's what happens when you text me while I'm doing Facebook Live. Um, uh, so can I share the difference between using hand sanitizer versus using a disinfecting wipe to clean the surface of your uh, of, of my car or my cart? Um, so uh, it really depends on the compound and it really depends on what's in there, it, what's in that, that sanitizer or that disinfectant. And what we're looking for, um, and I, I put the link up to this early on, I will do this again right now. Um, what we're really looking for uh, is 
a compound as a sanitizer that is on uh, this somewhat magical but not really magical list that CDC has uh, has talked about um, that that EPA uh, the um, Environmental Protect Protection Agency uh, has published around um, uh, COVID-19. And so let me find that EPA list N. Um, there, uh, what, I, what I need to know and what you want to know about is, is the thing that I am um, sanitizing or trying to disinfect with on this list. And so as I'm looking at list N right now, um, as of today, there are 357 different products on there um, with specific company names, specific product names. Um, if you search whatever you're looking for um, that you have on hand, uh, it'll tell you whether it's on this list. And this is sort of our best available information about what we know is registered for efficacy against coronaviruses in general. Now, it doesn't mean that we have data specific to um, SARS-CoV-2 because we're really just 85 days into this virus knowing about it. So we actually don't have a lot of very specific data on this, but we this is the best thing that we have to go on. We believe that this uh, virus, when it comes to infective um, uh, inactivation with compounds, will act very similar to what we would see with other coronaviruses. So this is what I want. For, so the first thing I want to know is, is what I'm using on this list. Now, some of the things, and, and this is why I think about hand sanitizer differently from uh, disinfecting wipes. Disinfecting wipes um, that are on this list are really not built for repeated use over and over again on my hands. And the repeated use over and over again on my hands with something like um, a surface disinfectant, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll take a, uh, an, an example here, um, hydrogen peroxide or sodium sodium hypochlorite is probably a best best example. So that's sodium hypochlorite is what we would expect to see in in uh, in bleach. If I apply bleach over and over again to my hands, it's really going to destroy my hands. It's going to um, start to impact um, my skin. It's going to lead to cracking. It's going to lead to um, uh, burning. Uh, it's not built for over and over again application. Uh, and so that's why I need to go to a hand sanitizer that is formulated with moisturizer specifically for repeat use over and over again. We, we have, um, uh, because sanitizer is, is really quite difficult to find, uh, I'll put a link up uh, to this um, as, uh, as well, but we, we have a uh, recipe that we have uh, adapted from the World Health Organization on do-it-yourself hand sanitizer. Um, and so this includes, uh, and, and you'll see this isn't a chlorine base, it's not sodium hypochlorite, it's uh, hydrogen peroxide um, and um, uh, isopropyl alcohol, and then a little bit of glycerin to allow the spread and actually do a little protection of your of your hands. Um, but that's what that's the, the thing that we really want to focus on is making sure we understand the difference between repeated use and surface sanitizing um, of, of and, you know, anything. And that's really, really um, matters. Um, and uh, Sarah, I'll also add on. Thank you very much for um, uh, um, uh, highlighting this. Um, sharing some information about contact time. Absolutely. And I didn't mention this. Everything on list N, and if you have a chance to go to that link, um, go go take a look. It talks specifically about how long um, this compound in a specific concentration, um, you know, based on what the manufacturer says, needs to be a left untouched for full disinfection. And in some cases, um, I'll look at uh, sodium hypochlorite from Clorox as one. They're uh, looking at towelettes. Um, and on hard, non-porous surfaces, it only needs one minute of contact time. Other um, uh, types of uh, disinfectants, like a quaternary ammonia, um, needs a very high concentration and needs a 10-minute contact time. And it really depends on whatever the, um, uh, the compound says. Now, for this, 
this really matters. I can't just use the compound and then rinse it off right away. That contact time is needed to really work with the biology of the virus and make sure that it's cutting through anything that, that might be there and doing a really good job. Um, Kathy, Kathy asks, is there a way of using hydrogen peroxide for sanitizing or do you have to use a product for that is on the EPA last, list? Kathy, um, you really need to use a product that is on the EPA list because hydrogen peroxide itself comes in varying different um, uh, uh, concentrations and you really want to make sure that you're matching up whatever you have with something that's here. So high, what we know is that these compounds have been evaluated for efficacy specifically for coronavirus and just taking hydrogen peroxide off the, off the shelf at, I don't know what percentage concentration would be, um, and not having sort of the interaction of other compounds that might be in these formulations where it might evaporate too quickly um, and not have that full contact time. That's the important part of, of using list N. So, so I don't, I, you know, the quick answer is no, there's not a way to use hydrogen peroxide for sanitizing with any, um, uh, uh guarantee with any, um, uh, confidence of efficacy if it's not explicitly on this list as as a specific you know um, product name um, and 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 so because of all these other factors in the manufacturing of it uh, and and so I, I would really encourage people not to to just sort of take alcohol or hydrogen peroxide and, and try and use that um, you really want to make sure that you're you're trying to get stuff that's that's on this list the good news is in certain times, um, as I've gone to um, gone to the grocery store um, early in the morning, uh, when shipments of this are coming in, uh, I have seen some of the some things, especially um, the Clorox brand, the Lysol brand, um, um, different um, uh, consumer Earth Laboratories, different consumer facing um, uh, um, brands that are that are on the shelves. They just go very quickly, um, so. Uh, you know, excellent, excellent question. Um, Audrey Kresge brings up a good point about what about the CDC bleach formula formula for disinfecting? Yes, that's the only one that I would suggest that you could use, um, not hydrogen peroxide, um, because at the and and this is one that it's a little bit um, uh, difficult to to really like get our minds around. But the CDC bleach formula for disinfecting essentially gets you to very close to a, a thousand parts per million bleach, which um, Oh, is much higher than we would expect in other normal food service sanitation. We're somewhere in between 50 and 150 parts per million usually. So it's so it's 10 times the 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 efficacy, um, uh, or it's not 10 times the efficacy. It's 10 times the concentration, and that 10 times the concentration really allows the contact time to happen for for this virus. The the big drawback is if I'm putting the thousand part per million CDC bleach formula on my countertops or on um, metal surfaces over time it's really going to degrade them or has the potential to, to degrade them because that really high parts per million um, concentration is is uh, it can be really um, uh, harmful to, to certain certain surfaces over time and so it's the next best thing if you can't get what's on that list but you but you do have to think about if I'm using it over and over again, that high concentration is much higher than what, what I would normally use it in as a you know, normal spray bottle, uh, as a sanitizer in my, um, you know, in my, in my kitchen. Great. Whew, 12 56 PM Eastern time. So, uh, you got a couple more minutes. If you have other questions to throw into the, to the chat box, uh, again, I apologize for, for getting started late. I will know how to do this, uh, in a better, uh, uh you know, more, uh, convenient, uh, format on time next time. Uh, but I, you know, I'm happy to, happy to do this. I think we'll try and do this once, uh, you know, as new information comes out, we'll, um, we'll talk through some of the, uh, uh, information we have, you know, today I really wanted to focus on, on food safety, um, and information related to grocery shopping and, and things to do in your home. But as we, as we kind of expand, um, what we know about COVID-19 uh, and SARS-CoV-2, um, we'll really be um, uh, talking more about it. Um, the, the benefit of doing Facebook Live at home is, as you can probably hear in the background, my dog is currently outside um, and he's barking to get back in. So hopefully one of my kids uh, will let him in or you'll continue to hear him barking in the background. 
Um, I think we captured all the questions here. Candace, um, let me make sure if there's anything else uh, that I haven't seen. I don't think so. Candace, is there anything? Uh, Candace or Natalie or Debbie, if were there any questions that you guys saw or received that we haven't um, uh, addressed? And if so, can you just put them into the into the um, comment box, and I'll I'll try and tackle them. All right, I just got a message from Candace on Slack that I got them all. All right, well, thank you so much for for joining. Um, uh, this video will uh, will we'll keep this up um, at the uh, Safe Plates Food Safety Information Center uh, Facebook page, and uh, like I said, we'll be doing more of these uh, as we go along. Um, and uh, I'll, I'm happy to take questions uh, through the uh, Safe Plates uh, Food Safety Information Center website. Um, and, and your and your Facebook page, um, not website, Facebook page on Twitter. Um, you can follow me at Benjamin Chapman. Um, I will put that here in the uh, chat box. Um, and uh, we'll do uh, as much uh, about this as uh, uh, as many times as we can. Oops, that eh, won't let me do it. Oh, we have one more. Uh, one more question from Audrey uh, before we wrap up. How should I clean my cloth face mask? Great, great question. Um, this is one of the things that uh, I think we're evolving our information on. And so we're working on some uh, some best practices around cloth uh, face masks. What I, what I will suggest is that CDC, excuse me, explicitly has on their website uh, information about laundry in COVID-19. So as I talk through this, let me see if I can find that. Um, so we can put a link uh, in. Um, basically, the cloth face masks, I, I, you know, Audrey brings up um, a great question here because as, as I mentioned before, when I talked about um, uh, the, the face masks, um, one of the things that we're really trying to do with, face with cloth face masks, it's not so much you wearing it being protective, uh, there's a small, a little bit of protection there, but the real sort of protection for everybody is that if you're asymptomatic, it is catching all of the moisture particles that you might be uh, putting out. Um, so, so I would expect that if we assume that people are asymptomatic, that those cl cloth face masks, they will get wet over time, they'll get, they'll get moist, and we wanna make sure that we're um, cleaning and sanitizing them and using the CDC um, laundry suggestions that I will put right or that I just put in um, to the to the box uh, will, will will be enough for washing away and inactivating the virus and really what CDC is saying is put them in the lawn in, in the washing machine at the hottest possible temperature that you have um, and that's gonna um, uh, do its best job at, at inactivating the virus and, and rinsing it away but really really great question and it's one o'clock um, uh, p.m. on uh, Eastern time. So I think we're gonna end it there, uh, but please keep the questions coming on the, our Facebook page or at, on Twitter and we'll do this again. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.